lovely. So we're just getting towards one minute past seven. So very promptly, we will get going because uh, I know there's loads of interest in tonight's talk. Hello from Nebraska. Thank you for joining us. OK, so we'll begin. A very warm welcome to today's talk tonight or so this morning, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, I'm Bethany Gaunt, Associate Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, which was established five years ago in memory of the late British historian. As I said, I can see that many of you joining us today are regular attendees, so you will no doubt be aware that Sir Martin wrote very widely on 20th century topics and was famously the official biographer of Sir Winston Churchill. Here at the centre, we like to offer you talks by eminent researchers on the topics that Sir Martin studied, and we hope that you enjoy these insights into the world of academic history. All of our talks, as you'll know, are free, but if you would like to make a donation, I'll pop the link into the chat. We are a charity and we rely on your generosity, and we do appreciate your support very much. Before I introduce today's esteemed guest, I just want to express my gratitude for everyone's patience after we had to postpone this talk from its original date. I'm really pleased that we were able to find a new date and that so many of you are able to join us here today. So, I am delighted at last to welcome Dr. Carlotta Ferrara degli Uberti to the centre. Carlotta is based in Italy and today she will be talking about the new exhibition at the Museum of Italian Judaism and the Shoah in Ferrara, Italy. Carlotta is one of the curators of the current exhibition, which is called Beyond the Ghetto, Inside and Out, and which showcases four centuries of Italian Jewish history from 1516 to 1914. A number of you got in touch with me recently um, to say that you have Italian ancestry or a particular link to the country, and there's been a lot of excitement about today's topic. So those of you who've read a little bit about Italian Jewish history or have those personal links will know that it is an absolutely fascinating and unique story. I might be biased because I am an Italianist myself, but it is well worth finding out more about the rich and dynamic Italian Jewish experience over the centuries. And Carlotta is very well placed to start us off on our voyage of discovery. She is a history professor at the University of Pisa and has published widely on 19th and early 20th century Italian Jewish history. I must also acknowledge here my own personal admiration for Carlotta, who kindly acted as an examiner for my PhD viva back in 2018. And I can sincerely say that I am a lot less nervous than the last time I saw you, Carlotta. <laughs> so today we're going to be treated to a behind the scenes insight into the creation of the exhibition on Italian Jewish history and the challenges that Carlotta and the curatorial team faced in pulling this work together. Carlotta has prepared a presentation and we will have time for a few questions at the end. Uh, you can message me directly or put those in the general chat. If you are new to Zoom, you'll find the button to type a message at the centre of the bar along the bottom of your screen. It's just a little icon that looks, looks like a speech bubble. So I know we are all very excited to hear more about your important exhibition. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Carlotta, and I'll now pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. And, and let me begin by thanking uh, well the audience and also especially by thanking uh, Bethany Gaunt and uh, Professor Gilbert for uh, inviting me. And uh, I am really delighted to, to be able to discuss this work with a, a broader and international audience, albeit only in this sort of virtual uh, format. And um, let me uh, apologize uh, immediately uh, for, for, for my English because I have not had the opportunity to practice my English as often as I would have liked to do since I uh, came back to Italy after leaving the UCL. Um, and, and this means um, that uh, now and then my mind just goes blank and I cannot find my words. So <laughs> I hope you will be patient. Uh, I am going to present uh, the exhibition Beyond the Ghetto Inside and Out, 
which is still open to the public uh, at the Museum of uh, Italian Judaism and the Shoah in Ferrara, and it will be opened until the 3rd of July. Uh, so you have some time <laughs> to come to Italy and, and visit the exhibition. But um, before delving into the description uh, and analysis of the exhibition, uh, I think it's useful to, to say a few words on the museum itself, uh, because you may not be very familiar with it. So let me share my screen and my slides. Oh, okay, I hope you can you can see it. And um, this is uh, the museum as uh, it is now. Mm. The museum was uh, was instituted um, by law mm, as a national museum in 2003. And um, uh, uh, it was instituted as a Holocaust museum. Uh, Museo Nazionale della Shoah mm, was the original name of this museum. And uh, let me remind you that the Italian parliament instituted the Giorno della Memoria so Holocaust Memorial Day uh, in January 2000. But uh, the law instituting the museum was not followed by uh, concrete action mm, in the following years. So what happened? In 2006, the municipality of Rome uh, uh, decided to create in Rome, in the capital, a museum of, of the Shoah. And this was immediately uh, perceived as a bit of a challenge mm, to the other project, because the idea was that it would not make sense to have all of a sudden two Holocaust museums mm, in Italy. Um, so in December to 2006, the parliament this, uh, changed the name by law again, because this is a national museum, changed the name of the museum to be created in Ferrara to Museo Nazionale dell'Ebraismo Italiano e della Shoah, National Museum of Italian Judaism and the Shoah. Uh, and um, the museum would have the mission to showcase 2000 years of Italian Jewish history. So to, and I'm quoting from the official document, to bear witness to the events that have characterized the 2000 years of Jewish presence in Italy, and, and the quote while the museum in Rome would remain focused exclusively on the Holocaust. Mm. So, uh, of course, much could be said about these dynamics and uh, also about the direct involvement of the Union of Italian Jewish Communities uh, in this uh, process. But um, this discussion would lead us uh, far from our uh, specific topic today. Um, suffice it to say, for now, that the museum in Rome does not exist yet. Mm. Uh, but uh, there is a foundation museum of the Shoah, uh, which is very active in promoting debates, conferences, events, and in reaching out to schools. Works to build the, the MACE, so MACE is the acronym uh, for the museum in Ferrara, uh, started in, in 2011, and the chosen site is an ex-prison. I think you can, you can sort of see it if you look at the building there. Um, at the moment, the original building has been entirely renovated, and it hosts the administrative offices, uh, the bookshop, and a provisional exhibition area. And then there is this garden outside. So this allowed the museum to, to open its doors in 2017 and to become operative, but major construction works are still ongoing. Uh, more physical space is needed for the museum to be able to sort of fully develop its mission. But uh, the work that has been done so far um, has been very important in my opinion. It is worth remembering again, that the maze is a national museum, which really sets it apart from the many museums uh, managed by uh, Italian Jewish communities, and there are many. So these smaller institutions do an excellent job and play an important role at local level, but the mission, the structure, the responsibilities of a national museum are 
completely different. The museum must respond to the needs of a broader audience and it owes its existence to the idea, to the acknowledgement that Italian Jewish history is in fact Italian history. It's not just the history of a tiny minority that may be relevant to that specific group, but something that is an important part of the nation's past and present. So apart from organizing um, uh, events, book presentations, workshops, and hosting a variety of temporary exhibitions, the MACE has actively commissioned, promoted, and sponsored three major exhibitions on Italian Jewish history. Um, the first one uh, was entitled Jews and Italian History, the First Thousand Years which was quite, uh, quite a challenge uh, to uh, 2018. The second one was the Renaissance Speaks Hebrew 2019. And the third one is the one we are discussing today. It should have been inaugurated in April 2020, but COVID had something to say about it. So we had to uh, postpone the inauguration to October 2021. And when I say we, I mean, uh, of course, the museum, the current director, uh, Amedeo Spagnoletto, but most of all, I mean the curatorial team. And this is in fact the fruit of a team effort and it could not have been uh, otherwise. I worked with Sharon Reichel, uh, who is also the curator of the museum, Andreina Contessa, the director of the museum and park of the Castello di Miramare in Trieste, and Simonetta della Seta, uh, the former director of the MACE. So we brought to the project a variety of skills, which was crucial to the success um, of, of the project itself. As an academic, for example, I had never tried, as a historian, uh, I had never tried to tell a complex and multifaceted story through objects without having much space to write and no space at all for footnotes. This is really difficult for an academic. <laughs> the challenge was fun, but it, it was definitely a challenge for me. Now, it seems important to explain uh, the choice of the title and subtitle of the exhibition. So beyond the, the ghetto, inside and out. It was not easy to uh, choose a unifying thread that would allow visitors to make sense, or at least some sense, of 400 years of Italian Jewish history. Uh, because the exhibition, as uh, Bethany reminded us, covers the period between the 16th century and the beginning of the 20th century, from the institution of the first ghetto in Venice in 1516 to the outbreak of the First World War. Uh, so any choice of a unifying thread, of a guiding path, would, uh, of course, be also an act, inevitably an act uh, of interpretation would have to take into account, uh, to a certain extent, the evolution of the scholarly debate, and would have to take into account also our uh, understanding of the visitor's backgrounds and preconceptions uh, regarding Jewish history, their knowledge or lack of knowledge regarding Jewish history. Um, so I think it is safe to say uh, that most Italians do not know anything about Judaism and Jewish history. Uh, or maybe they have a vague idea of what ghettos were and of what happened during the Holocaust. Younger generations have heard something at school regarding the deportations, extermination camps, Auschwitz, the horrific details of what happened here. Some of them may know a little bit about the Italian racist laws of 1938, and many may have read Primo Levi, if this is a man. But still, these Jews that were persecuted and killed don't have any specific identity or, or history uh, for the sort of the average Italian, if you allow this expression. So Jews are only seen as victims, uh, and this has detrimental consequences. 
recently I gave a talk about the fascist racist laws of 1938 for to, to high school students, uh, Italian high school students. And right before the start of my presentation, I asked uh, them if they had any idea of how many Jews lived in Italy at the time, so in the 1930s. No one got it right. So one said one million, another said 300,000. And in fact, we are talking of roughly 35,000, 40,000 people tops. Uh, so really a tiny minority. So we, uh, as the curatorial team, we wanted in agreement with the museum's mission to create an exhibition that would be about Jewish life, its complexity, richness and the interconnections. The title Beyond the Ghetto, Inside and Out, reflects the will to focus on the social, economic, cultural interactions between Jews and non-Jews that, as new research keeps showing us, developed despite the walls of the ghetto. And on the, also on the peculiarities of the social and cultural life that took shape because of the presence of these walls, or also because of the presence of these walls. Moving forward chronologically and coming to the 19th century and the emancipation, the expression inside and out is meant to explain that the newly reached equality created new challenges for the members of this very tiny minority. They had to revisit what it meant to be Jewish and also to revisit and understand in a different way what it might mean to be Italian, to be an Italian citizen and to be an Italian Jew or a Jewish Italian, uh, if, you, if, you, if you wish. Um, so there is still an inside and out, but these are um, always interconnected. Mm. The exhibition also, and um, I think it is important to, to say this, is not about anti-Semitism, but our goal was also not to sugarcoat mm, this long phase of Italian history. We wanted to focus on Jewish life, not on discriminations and persecutions, but we didn't want to create an idyllic narrative either. Especially in the second part about the Risorgimento, the 19th century, there was the risk of presenting a somewhat sort of triumphant march from isolation to equality and inclusion with Jews and non-Jews united in the struggle for the unification of the country and at the same time in the struggle for the emancipation of the Jews. This is how this period has actually been represented, mm, presented and represented since the end of the 19th century and by many scholars well into the 1980s. And as the sort of the Risorgimento expert of the group, I was particularly keen to avoid this simplistic narrative. Also, the exhibition is not about religion or religious history. Uh, you will not find a systematic explanation of the main holidays, ritual objects, rites of passage, and the like. We have chosen objects that happen to be ritual objects, such as ornaments for the Torah scrolls or objects related to specific holidays, but they are in the exhibition because they tell us something uh, about Jewish sort of social life, hmm? the Jews' relationship with non-Jews, the materials that they had access to. And uh, let me show you um, uh, a few examples. So you find here these two mapot. Um, so these are uh, a mappa is sort of a binder for the um, Torah scrolls. Um, these are richly decorated, but if you look closely, of course the picture does not do justice to the object, but if you look uh, clo uh, um, uh, if, you, if you pay attention, you can see that these mapot are very rich, but they are actually a, a patchwork of different uh, fabrics, different textiles. So they tell us something about also some of the activities, mm, uh, some of the jobs that Jews uh, did, uh, Jewish men men and uh, also Jewish women did because um, women then sort of um, uh, created these artifacts. Mm. Um, ritual objects, not only ritual objects, but uh, this was just an example mm, of some of the ritual objects that we uh, included and why we decided to do so. Um, this is a, a beautiful example, a rare example on the left of a wooden panel for a sukkah. 
So Sukkah is a temporary hut uh, that Jews are supposed to build um, in their gardens, in uh, outside their homes for the uh, holiday of Sukkot. Uh, this um, uh, is uh, dated to the end of uh, the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Um, and uh, this comes actually from the Abbey of Pralia, uh, about the interconnections. Now this is, uh, this is, can be found normally in an abbey. Um, and um, uh, we chose this panel that represents the building of the sukkah. So it is sort of a meta narrative uh, where this is a sukkah and in the painting, uh, there is the building of the sukkah. Again, uh, we were not interested in explaining the holiday, mm, then we do explain the holiday, but that was, that was not the main goal. Mm. Um, let me Oh, this is sorry. I will wait for the for the for the next um, slide. Uh, the section on synagogues is particularly telling in, in this respect. Um, so, working with the designers and the architect uh, Giovanni Tortelli, we recreated the narrow space of the ghetto and the invisibility of pre-emancipation synagogues. As you probably know, uh, no sign that would announce the presence of a Jewish synagogue was allowed. Mm. Um, so synagogues were hidden um, in the pre-emancipation period. So the only way you can find to sort of have a peek inside uh, when you are visiting the exhibition is through a very small opening in a wall. Mm. Uh, but when you do look, you see wonderful, richly decorated objects. Mm. So let me uh, show these images. Mm. And these objects for us are important for what they tell us of the way the wealthiest families showcased and asserted their power within the community. And let us remember that the synagogue was not only a place for prayer, a space for prayer, uh, but it was a social space. It was very important as a social space. Now, in the 19th century, the space opens up and we find the so-called monumental synagogues, uh, Turin, Florence, Rome, buildings that really occupy the urban space. And in a way they scream the Jewish presence, um, a presence that can finally be seen. And now I've chosen just uh, um, these three examples. So Turin, on the left, you see the original project uh, for the synagogue, the, the, the building that then became the Mole Antonelliana and the synagogue that was actually built on the right, inaugurated in 1884. Then Florence, inaugurated in 1882, and uh, Rome, inaugurated uh, on the 27th of July, 1904. So it's, uh, there's a huge difference uh, between the pre-emancipation synagogues and the post-emancipation uh, synagogues, a, a difference that has all to do with the uh, changed status in uh, Jews. Um, so we, uh, of course, uh, going back to the uh, sort of a little bit the behind the scenes of the exhibition. We really wanted the exhibition to be historically accurate, of course, uh, standing on solid scientific ground. But at the same time, we had to be mindful not only uh, of the needs of the audience, uh, but also the sort of the physical space that was available to us. Uh, as I said, uh, this, this space is not great at the moment because this is, this is only a limited space for temporary exhibitions and we do not have the, the real buildings that will constitute the museum when everything, when the works will be um, complete. So uh, also, uh, if I think of the recent evolution of the scholarly debate on Jewish history, uh, uh, I, I, I think, well, the transregional, transnational dimension has become central, absolutely central. And this is an aspect that probably does not come across prominently in the exhibition, uh, where we have taken the national framework as central. And we decided to do so uh, because uh, it was not only a matter of, well, simplifying things for us, uh, but it was, uh, it was a conscious choice because precisely because of what I said at the beginning. So 
so little is known mm, uh, on average about this history um, and how it is really part of the national history that it seemed only right to begin with the national framework. And then maybe in the future, mm, there will be uh, other exhibitions just focusing on the transregional and transnational aspects. Um, and then from my perspective, especially, it was important to uh, just um, in, in a way, if you allow me, displace the Holocaust from the center stage, like they like really give space to something else. Mm. Um, now, let us uh, walk through some of the rooms uh, that we have not explored yet. Of course, not all of them. But uh, again, let me tell you that the photos do not do justice to the objects. Um, so this is the first thing that you would see if you were visiting the exhibition. And this is a wonderful painting of Esther before Ahasuerus, uh, Ahasuerosh in, in Hebrew, um, by the very important Venetian uh, artist Sebastiano Ricci. Uh, this is dated 1733. Ricci, and this is my colleague, Andreina Contessa. There is a video with, with, with her um, uh, in this room. Uh, this is on loan from the Quirinale. The painting was owned by the Piedmontese and then Italian royal family, the Savoia, and was moved from Turin to Rome when Rome became the capital of the newly unified kingdom in 1871. It is, of course, a very beautiful painting, but this is, again, not why we chose it. The biblical figure of Queen Esther was a very popular subject for both Jews and non-Jews, and it is meant, and, and Ritchie was not Jewish, and uh, it is meant to represent the constant, although sometimes difficult, interaction between Jews and non-Jews. More specifically, it represents the need for Jews to negotiate and renegotiate their position and the conditions of their life in the midst of Christian societies in a relationship that is fruitful and complex, but it is undoubtedly based on an imbalance of power. Here uh, we find a beautiful detail mm, of the painting. This is Queen Esther kneeling in front of her husband and king. And this is a Jewish version of the story, Megillat Esther, uh, so a scroll with the story of Esther, um, 17th century. Uh, it is a manuscript on parchment with decorations that are printed, applied over the parchment, and subsequently painted with watercolors. So it's, it's very beautiful and it is a technique. I'm not an art historian, uh, so don't ask me for too many details, but it is a technique that I've been told it's, it's quite unique. I mean, it was not extremely common. Then we decided to include this uh, book. Uh, you see part of the cover here. It is a very famous book, the Historia dei Riti Ebraici. So, um, history of Jewish rituals by Leone da Modena. Leone da Modena was a very important rabbi at the time with a transnational network um, of sort of intellectuals and rabbis, Jews and, and non-Jews. This was printed in Venice in 1638. Um, and uh, it is particularly interesting because Leone da Modena wrote this book not for Jews. He wrote it for non-Jews. So he was looking for a, a communication. He wanted to explain mm, to non-Jews what Jewish rituals uh, are about. Mm. So again, this uh, uh, for us was important because the focus was uh, on the connections. Mm. And ag again, focusing on the connections, we move forward in time and we change location. We are in Rome now in 1702. Um, this is an edict uh, issued in Rome by the Cardinal Vicar um, and on the 10th of October, 1702. And this edict states that Christians, both men and women, are forbidden to participate in the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, which is very interesting because, of course, if you have to prohibit something, it means that it happens. Uh, so it means that Jews and Christians uh, did, in fact, mingle with one another in, 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 in sort of social situations. 
And it is also interesting because we don't have many sources sort of telling us something about the life of the uh, lower strata of society, both Jewish and non-Jewish. Um, so uh, we have to find alternative ways to, to find out what happened. Um, moving on again, chronologically and geographically, we move to Livorno now. And uh, this is an object that is not precious per se, um, by, any, by any means. Um, it is a, a sampler in silk. Uh, this was embroidered by a, a Jewish girl uh, uh, from Livorno, Eva Gutierrez Pena, uh, in 1805. Uh, it, was, it was embroidered as an assignment. It's basically homework. Mm -hmm. uh, girls had to uh, learn, uh, also girls who attended Jewish schools had to learn how to uh, embroider. Uh, and um, it is quite difficult to, to see from the, the picture, but uh, you have, if you start from the top right, you find the creation of Adam and Eve. And then if you go counter counterclockwise, you find uh, scenes uh, from the Bible. And I have a detail uh, from the central scene. And this is uh, Moses receiving the tables of the law from God. Actually, I, I am, you see the, the hand of God. And I am not completely sure that this is allowed by uh, uh, Jewish law because you cannot represent God. So I would have to ask a rabbi uh, about this. But still, it is, it is, it is a very... Um, sort of a uh, nice uh, also example of what uh, uh, what uh, sort of the education was supposed to be for young Jewish girls uh, attending Jewish schools. Mm -hmm. It was also a way to include um, um, girls. Uh, we don't know anything about this girl. Mm -hmm. uh, she signs, she embroiders her name. That's why uh, we know that she was Eva Gutierrez Peña, but we know something about the family, uh, but, but we don't know anything uh, uh, else about her. Um, but uh, for us, mm -hmm, this was this was a meaningful uh, object. And we'll stay in Livorno with these um, hands. Mm, uh, so Yad or Yadaim in, in Hebrew. Um, this is a small hand that is used to sort of follow the reading of the Torah scroll. Um, and this, the, 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 the special thing about these ones is that they are uh, made of coral. Uh, at the very beginning of the 19th century in Livorno. And this is because this is very typical of Livorno, typical uh, Livor Livornese uh, artifact, um, because uh, Jewish uh, merchants in Livorno um, uh, played a prominent role uh, in the trade of coral and diamonds. Livorno was a very important um, free port mm, uh, throughout the 18th century and uh, still at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, so it was more of an international city than an Italian city. It was really in connection with the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, Salonika. And, um, and uh, so again, these objects, so they are beautiful, but also they tell mm, a story. And also they go in the direction of that uh, transnational history uh, that I sort of hinted at at some point. Then let's move to, to the 19th century and the, the Risorgimento. So we, we find here to your right, you have the king, uh, Victor Emmanuel II, and your left, you have Giuseppe Mazzini. So some of you may be familiar with, with this name because um, uh, he's a well-known figure also outside of Italy. And uh, let's focus on this portrait of Giuseppe Mazzini, a patriot Republican. And uh, we decided to include it for a variety of reasons. One is that this was painted by a Jewish painter, uh, an Italian Jewish painter from Livorno, Serafino de Tivoli. Uh, so he was born in Livorno, then he moved to Florence um, and he um, uh, was a member of the group of the Macchiaioli. Um, and he fought as a volunteer in one of the famous battles of the Risorgimento, Curtatone Montanara. He then moved to Paris and London, and in London he met uh, Giuseppe Mazzini and painted this, this portrait. 
Mazzini lived in um, London uh, from 1837 to 1848, and then again uh, after the end of the Roman Republic. Uh, and from London, he coordinated a transnational patriotic net network um, uh, with the help of many Italian Jews, Italian and non-Italian Jews. Uh, the Nathan Rosselli family is, is very well known for uh, sort of helping Mazzini uh, in sort of building this transnational network. Um, and uh, we also included a quotation, uh, you can see it on, on the left, this quotation is from one of the letters that Mazzini sent from London to, to his mother, who was in Italy. And this was written on the 6th of January, 1841. And he writes, I also went to the lunch for the first Sunday of the year among the Israelites. So this would be the uh, Nathan um, uh, Rosselli family. And I came out of it a miracle, safe and sound replete as usual of kindnesses to the point of boredom. I don't know if I have already told you to reassure you that Angelo, this would be Angelo Usilio, one of his closest collaborators, also dines there. And I don't know if you are aware that Angelo is an Israelite. So you see, either have, they'll have to slaughter a co-religionist too, or Angelo himself is part of the plot. Now, we decided to include this quotation because we do not have, unfortunately, the original letter sent by his mother, but it is very clear that Mazzini's mother was very worried at the idea that her son would uh, go and have lunch with Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, clearly, she was worried that he could be killed uh, by Jews in a sort of a ritual murder situation. And he's trying to reassure her. But um, it was also our way to sort of include um, idea in the exhibition that um, anti-Jewish prejudices were uh, very widespread um, at the time. So as I said, this is not an exhibition about anti-Semitism, but we wanted to acknowledge um, the uh, widespread presence of anti-Jewish uh, uh, prejudices, preconceptions among sort of really uh, all the strata of the population from the intellectuals uh, to the um, um, so the poor, the poor, the poorest um, uh, strata of the population, uh, and um, remaining uh, on the topic of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism, I will not enter into this debate of the names now. Um, we can move to this painting, um, which uh, represents a, a very famous case: the kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara. So I. Mm, mm, I think some of you at least uh, will be familiar with the story. Um, Edgardo Mortara was a six years old um, Jewish uh, kid uh, from the community of Bologna, a uh, Jewish community of Bologna. Uh, and um, um, in, in late June, um, 1858, he was uh, taken from his family by the papal police because he had been baptized secretly by a Catholic servant. Uh, and uh, so it was uh, from the point of view of the Pope and the church, um, he could not be raised by Jewish parents. He had to be raised as a Christian, as a Catholic by the church. Um, so he's kidnapped, he's taken from his family and he will never go back to his family. Um, what is really interesting about this case, because of, of course this had been happening for centuries. Uh, this was not a special thing. What is special about this case is that um, uh, there was uh, this caused, um, this event caused a huge international debate. It was a scandal mm, uh, in 1858 and in the following years. Um, so this is the uh, novelty. Mm, this is what's new about the case. Uh, everybody talked about it. Uh, the French press, British, American, and what have you. It was really a huge international debate. So um, they uh, could not um, uh, get the result of uh, having um, Edgardo brought back to his parents. He actually became a priest growing up. Um, but still, it was it was very important that uh, this behavior from the part on the part of the church was not considered to be acceptable anymore. 
uh, in the uh, 18, late 1850s. Um, and the painting was painted by um, Moritz Daniel, Daniel Oppenheim in 1862, so a, a quite well-known German-Jewish painter uh, who was um, especially famous for painting portraits of the German-Jewish um, uh, bourgeoisie. Uh, and then this painting sort of disappeared for a very long time. And it was found again very recently, and it is now part of a private collection uh, in the United States. And we were very happy that the museum managed to have it on loan from this private collection for the exhibition. It is the first time that it can be uh, seen. And uh, this is um, it's not a great photo, but still you can see the painting uh, with the, the Jewish boy um, uh, recognizable because he, he has this, this uh, Talet Katan on and the priest, the friar, and the nun on the left. They wouldn't have been really there, uh, all of them. Only the police was there. But it is a way uh, in which the painter really shows the uh, coercive force, the strength uh, of the church. And then on the right, you have uh, the women of the family in a very traditional sort of uh, representation of uh, female uh, sort of weakness also no? uh, and uh, the father who is he's powerless but still he's trying to do something he has a more active role he, he goes towards the child and tries to do something while the women are just fainting uh, uh, in a very appropriate way um, for for the time um, and um, in the same room uh, in the exhibition we have a video uh, sort of telling the story sort of the long story of Christian anti-semitism and um, more specifically since we are in Italy a Catholic anti-semitism um, I, I have just a very, do, do I have time for very few uh, more, more slides? Okay, so uh, this is, we, we are now in full sort of risorgimento uh, uh, mood. Uh, this is a ketuba, so a ritual marriage contract uh, from 1860. Um, and it is, so the text is um, uh, the same that you can find in every uh, marriage contract. Um, but the decoration is very interesting because uh, it's not very rich in terms of color or material, but uh, you can see that, that there is a sort of secular trinity here. You have um, on top uh, the king, Victor Emmanuel II, who is the king of the, the father of the nation, the king of the resort. Orgimento. Then on the right, you have Garibaldi, another very well-known figure, not only uh, in Italy. And on the left, you have Cavour, who was the prime minister of the unification. So it is a, a, a way uh, in which this family, this couple getting married, tried to connect their Jewish identity because they are having a Jewish wedding uh, and, and their Italian identity. Uh, so there is this very strong patriotic uh, feeling um, and patriotic declaration, public declaration of patriotism, while at the same time, they, they're sort of keeping their Jewish identity and having this Jewish wedding in a traditional way. And um, less uh, sort of fun, but uh, this is also another example of a patriotic uh, ketuba. Uh, you just have here the colors of the, of the flag. So it's, it's uh, red, white, and, and, and green. Um, and uh, there are other, this is from Rome. The other one was from um, a place near Parma. Uh, and this one is um, from 1884. Uh, and, and we can find many of these, and also in other countries, actually. It's not a, a uniquely Italian, Italian phenomenon. Um, uh, I would like to quickly, because I would really would like to leave time for your questions, so very quickly to uh, tell you what happens uh, in the final part of the exhibition. So we decided in the final part of the exhibition to focus on families. Mm. So uh, Italian Jewish families going through the process of, um, well, uh, dealing with equality and the opportunities that the new state as citizens of the Kingdom of Italy would sort of uh, open for them. Uh, and at the same 
time finding ways, different ways, to um, remain linked to some sort of Jewish identity. And this can mean many different things for different individuals and different families. Um, so we have this um, nice open sort of, a, it's, it's a long room with light getting in, less dark than the previous ones, uh, with um, photos and objects mm, that tell the story of uh, different fam Jewish families, some Jewish families. And this is um, a, a section um, from the story of the Corinaldi family. Now the Corinaldi uh, were, um, uh, what Michele Corinaldi became Count Michele Corinaldi uh, by royal decree uh, in 1862. So you can see the coat of arms there. Uh, so this, they, this is a family, a Jewish family that becomes a part of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a, a series of objects here, objects that uh, are there to sort of describe, to, to, to let us see something, to have sort of glimpses uh, in their sort of what their daily life and social life would have uh, been like. And we uh, close with this object, uh, which is a trunk um, with that contains the equipment um, of a Red Cross nurse. Mm. Uh, this is Matilde Levi, married Viterbo, uh, and we, uh, the museum received as a donation this trunk with, with everything. It's incredible. Um, and uh, this is because we do not um, explain much about the First World War in the exhibition. We just close just at the beginning of the war. Mm. Uh, but it is a way to uh, start to, to hint at the fact that many Italian Jews participated in the First World War. Of course, they fought men and women, women in a different way, of course, many of them as Red Cross nurses. And this is uh, um, incredibly rich, uh, the, sort of the, the uh, equipment that we can find in this trunk. You can see drawings and like notes of the lessons that uh, she had to take and a sort of diploma and gloves and there is her um, uh, uniform. Um, so we, we close with this with this this object and a final video, which is a sequence of um, uh, photos of pictures uh, of Italian Jewish families. And I would close here and I'm very glad to take questions. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating to see that tour and also to hear about the decisions that went into creating those different spaces and rooms that was really fascinating thank you and i've been trying to keep up with questions as we've gone along so there, there are a few so are you happy for me to dive straight straight in and, and pass them to you yes, <laughs> so yes of course um janine asked is there is there a museum focused on the long jewish history in the period of the roman empire so the, before the common era. Um, and I remember you said that the first exhibition at the museum covered the first thousand years. Um, so which thousand years did that cover? <laughs> 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 yes, yes, of course, this is an important question. Uh, the first thousand years would be, uh, we, th there was no specific uh, sort of uh, date mm, uh, from where to begin, uh, but this would be uh, the first, first thousand years of the, the common era, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there is no specific museums that deals with what happened before that. Uh, before then, no, it's it's already quite ambitious for for <laughs> one museum to cover uh, this this very long because now it's more than two thousand years, of course, of Jewish Italian Jewish history. Absolutely, I suppose space for a future exhibition yes, <laughs> at some point. Yes, definitely. Yes. Um, coming on to that, I don't know if you noticed in the chat that there's actually a group of people, some of whom are listening today, that will be visiting the museum in October. Fantastic. From Canada and the US. So given that this exhibition, I think you said, finishes on the 3rd of July. Yes. Can you say what's in store next, what they might 
be seeing when they visit? Yes. So I know that uh, in October, I don't know the uh, exact date, but in October, a new exhibition will be inaugurated, which will be um, about uh, the holiday of Sukkot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, you will see because this holiday falls in the autumn. And um, uh, for example, it will be possible to see uh, all the 10 uh, panels of that uh, wooden um, sukkah. Uh, I showed uh, only one panel because it is the one that we included in this exhibition. But for that exhibition, uh, visitors will be able to see the whole thing. Um, and I, I know the curator um, is the Sharon Reichel. She, she's working on it right now. Uh, so this is what, what I know. And then there are, um, there is a, a sort of a, um, a, the beginning of a permanent exhibition uh, with some objects that have remained in the museum from the previous exhibitions. So the first thousand years and the uh, Risorgimento speaks Hebrew and something will remain from this exhibition, the uh, Beyond the Ghetto. Um, so it is definitely worth a visit. Brilliant. I'm very tempted to <laughs> book a trip to Italy now to see it. So that's brilliant. Um, we've got a raised hand, so I'll let you yeah. Unmute. I think it should work if I ask you to unmute. Oh, thank you. Uh, buonasera. Um, buonasera. I am a rabbi uh, living in Modena, a progressive rabbi, and I'm very interested in this. I'm also going to be meeting with a group coming from Canada when they come. In terms of uh, history of Italian Jews, we talk about Minhag Roma and the, the Jews being the oldest continuous community. But um, I'm really interested, especially in terms of helping to develop progressive Jewish identity, which is now starting to grow in Italy. We would like to connect back to something that is actually Italian. And I was just wondering, how would you define what that is? Because I've come across so far, you know, and maybe also I can contact you another time, not and take up everybody else's time to learn more about that. But the identity people seem to feel on the one hand you say that they they don't know what it is but you ask anybody and they say we have this we've been here longer than you know since roman times so could you just maybe say a little bit more about your perception of this yes so thank you it is a very difficult question so please feel free to get in touch anytime <laughs> via email and i would be really happy we, we can also meet at some point in person maybe um but uh well f first of all i, I don't know if uh, everyone uh, is aware of the fact that um uh, progressive Judaism, uh, really um, reformed Judaism uh, only came to Italy very, very recently, actually. We are talking 2000, 2001 uh, for the sort of uh, the inauguration of the sort of the first um, reformed synagogue. Uh, and still, it, it's, it's a quite a, a difficult life, isn't it? It's, it's not extremely, it's not extremely easy. Um, and it is striking because if we think of other European cases, France, uh, Britain, and Germany, uh, and of course the United States, well, the situation is, is very, very different. Already in mid 19th century, uh, you have a huge debate and the uh, growth of different strands of progressive Judaism, reform Judaism. Um, so it's, uh, um, uh, there is also much to be done in terms of research regarding the 19th century to have a better understanding of why this didn't take root in Italy, because it is not that it didn't come to Italy, it did come to Italy, because Italian rabbis and Italian Jews were in touch with uh, European, uh, the European co-religionists, and uh, there was a, a, a network and communication. Um, and the, the debates, actually some of the debates, happened in Italy too. But then, uh, for some reason, for many reasons, of course, um, um, Italian Judaism remained at least on paper orthodox. I'm saying at least on paper because uh, it doesn't mean that all Italian Jews like um, uh, are um, um, respect the Shabbat and all the rules that they are supposed to uh, sort of to 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 um, to obey to respect um, every day of their life. It's, not that, but on paper and officially, uh, Italian Judaism has remained 
um, uh, orthodox. And there is also a problem of recognition by the state uh, because uh, the Italian state signed an agreement, has an official agreement with the Union of Italian Jewish Communities. And this is a union only of orthodox Jewish communities with all, with all sorts of consequences. Uh, I was just uh, uh, saying this just in case part of the audience is not, is not aware of the situation. Uh, going back to your question, as I said, it's very, very difficult because um, um, Italian, uh, this happens everywhere, but maybe it is more, more evident in the Italian case. Um, Italian Judaism has always been a bit of a patchwork uh, because, of, because of how the history of the country developed, actually. So before the unification of the country, so we are mid 19th century, there were all these pre-unitarian states and uh, in each of them, uh, the situation of the Jews was different. The, the legislation was different. The culture, the language uh, in part uh, was different. And even within the same state, for example, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, um, uh, the situation of the Jews was not um, the same everywhere. You had a ghetto in Florence, a ghetto in Siena, and no ghetto in Livorno and Pisa. Uh, and you have a mainly Sephardic community in Livorno and Pisa, which was not the case for Florence and Siena. Um, and um, so it's, it, it's really uh, a, a mixed um, history, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint just to find uh, something that characterizes uh, sort of Italian Jewish identity sort of in, in the longer period, um, unless it is maybe just this fact that it is, it is uh, um, a mix of very different things um, with this um, idea, uh, which is very strong, you're right, it's, it's stronger in Rome, but it is strong uh, a bit everywhere, that it is an ancient, the Italian, the, the Jewish presence in, in the Italian peninsula is ancient, which is, which is of course true. Um, but I, I'm not sure I can really give you a, a clear and, you know, precise answer <laughs> and complete uh, and satisfying answer to your question. I'm very happy uh, to, to connect via email if, um, if, if you wish, it, it would be a pleasure. It sounds good. I'll, 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 um, I'll send you the email address if you're happy <laughs> to share. That'd be brilliant. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions coming through in the private chat and in the public chat, so I will keep going if you've got another few minutes. Yes, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, sure. So it was asked, is there a particular reason for the museum being located in Ferrara? Um, is that because it was an important centre of Italian Judaism? And related to that, has this museum replaced the Museo Ebraico, Ebraico di Ferrara? Okay, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, second part of the question, no, it has not. Uh, so there is still a very small mm, uh, museum of the uh, communi uh, Jewish community of Ferrara, uh, which is uh, managed by the Jewish community itself. Um, and the maze is something different, as I said, it is a national museum. Uh, so why Ferrara? Ferrara was indeed, uh, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, ha has a rich Jewish history, uh, but this is not why uh, Ferrara was chosen. It was chosen because um, the idea uh, to create a, a national museum, uh, which had to be at the beginning, would have had to be a museum of the a Holocaust Museum. Um, the idea was raised uh, in 2003 by Vittorio Sgarbi, uh, who is an art historian and a politician, uh, controversial figure uh, for many reasons uh, and uh, he is from Ferrara and also his political connections were all from Ferrara and he raised the idea and 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 that is basically why uh, it was uh, decided that it would be in Ferrara. That makes sense, thank you. <laughs> um, so in response to the patriotic Ketuba we saw, Kevin asked would these have been pre-printed and supplied in books to be completed when necessary, or would they have been individually created? They would have been individually created. Okay, so it's reflecting a, a real personality yes. of the people yes. involved. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, 
I really loved what you said about the difficulty in you being an academic and there being no space for footnotes in this sort of exhibition. And I was thinking that, I mean, especially over such a large uh, time period as well, the difficulty of condensing all that history into this exhibition. And so I wondered, was there an object that you ended up, up leaving out of the exhibition that you would have liked to have included? Well, many objects, but um, uh, we had to deal not only, and this is something that I learned uh, working on this exhibition, uh, it, it wasn't the first time uh, doing something like this. Um, so we had to deal not only with uh, the limits of the physical space, um, with, with, of course, time constraints, uh, because uh, we had, everything had to be ready for April 2020, although we didn't manage to, to inaugurate the exhibition then. Um, um, but also with, well, the availability of objects, because uh, not all the objects that we would have wanted to include were in fact available because, because the institution could not send them, would not allow them to travel. And then uh, we had additional problems of this kind um, uh, in 2020, because uh, when we saw that we wouldn't have been able to inaugurate the exhibition and we we moved the date to the end of 2021. At that point, it was not um, granted that all the objects would be available. Uh, and um, uh, most of them were, uh, luckily for us, so we didn't have to um, start uh, from scratch <laughs> designing a whole new thing but some of these objects uh, were not available anymore. Uh, for example, we would have liked to, in, we, we had decided to include uh, um, a portrait uh, of Ernesto Nathan, uh, who was a Jewish Freemason uh, mayor of Rome at the beginning of the 20th century uh, for quite a long time. Uh, he, he was a massively important figure um, at the time, and he was also a member of that uh, Nathan Rosselli family. So he had a connection with Mazzini. Um, and this painting, uh, this portrait was painted by uh, Balla, uh, who is a very important Italian uh, futurist painter. Uh, but unfortunately, this was not no longer available because it had to be part of another exhibition or uh, so things like this did happen. Um, as I said, luckily, most objects were, were still available because uh, otherwise it would have been really, 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 really difficult. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine having to have all the stress of the disruption of, of the pandemic when you're trying to pull together something with so many different parts that I think what even from the, what we saw today over the screen, it's clearly a huge achievement. And I'm very jealous of the people that will be traveling <laughs> to visit the museum in person. I've got to add it to my wish list now. But I yeah. think we've just passed eight o'clock in the UK. So I think we'll draw to a close there. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us this evening. You're welcome. Brilliant. And you need not have worried about your, your English. It was <laughs> sparkling as always. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed practicing on us today. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I, I am always worried that it, my, my English will not be good enough. Um, no. yeah, sorry, let me let me add if I if I may just just uh, just um, something about the exhibition that I didn't sure. say. So everything, all the um, explanatory panels, the labels, everything is both in Italian and in English. Really, so I think that's important. And the catalog of the exhibition also is available both in Italian and in English. Yeah, and I should add as well that um, when I was checking out the website of the museum, I shared the link at the start. There's a lot of really helpful information on there. So those of you who can't make it to Italy to see, have a look on the website. It's really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just do a quick plug for our next talk, which will be transporting us not to Italy, but to South Africa. So our next talk will take place on Monday next week, the 13th, and it's entitled What's in Store for the Jewish Community in South Africa? Uh, if you're interested, please do register and book your place. I think it's going to be great. But for tonight, thank you so much, Carlotta. That was a real pleasure. Thank you. And good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye.